今のこの時点では東京にダイバーシティを求めるという声が圧倒的に高いということになります都市の未来そして私たちのライフスタイルの未来がどうなっていくのかぜひ後のセッションでもそういうことを議論ぜひしていただきたいと思いますこの都市をこれからデザインするっていうのは今の都市の中でだとこの都市の中に流れてる空気だったり自然のデザインもできるわけですよねそれは本当にこの自然にある程度任せなきゃいけない生き物とかバイオロジーとかそっちからものを作るっていうこともこれから設計できると思うんですね Basics whereby potentials were necessary and design and creativity had to be thought very fast. Thank you very much for waiting, ladies and gentlemen. We would now like to start the Innovative City Forum seminar Ideas for Revitalizing Tokyo's Global Appeal. Thank you very much for coming today, despite your busy schedules. I'm with the Mori Memorial Foundation. My name is Yuko Hamada. I will serve as the moderator. Innovative City Forum is an international conference whose theme is designing the future for global cities and lifestyles from the viewpoint of advanced technologies, art and creative, and urban development. We debate the future of cities 20 years into the future, and we have been holding this international conference every year since 2013 in October. This year, from the 14th of October, over the course of three days, we will have that conference here at the Roppongi Hills. Now, today's Innovative City Forum uh, seminar is being held as part of the research building up to that international conference in October. We plan to hold several uh, such seminars before the conference. In today's seminar, uh, we are going to discuss issues from the viewpoint of urban development, and the Mori Memorial Foundation uh, is the organizer of today's event. Uh, we have uh, experts in the field of urban branding, architecture, and design gathered here today, and we will ask them to give their expert viewpoints, and uh, we shall discuss the strategy for revitalizing Tokyo's global appeal or global presence. First, I would like to call upon the executive director of the Mori Memorial Foundation, Professor Ichikawa, to give you the opening remark and also to give you the presentation about the urban intangible values. And Professor Ichikawa will moderate the session from this point on. Please.
Good evening. Thank you for the introduction. This is Ichikawa. Today, we're going to discuss the ideas for revitalizing Tokyo's global appeal. We want to find such ideas in this session. We have invited three panelists. First is Ms. Astrid Klein, architect, and then city branding strategist, Mr. J.T. Singh, and the designer, Mr. Gwenao Nicola. These are the three esteemed speakers. And they're going to give you wonderful presentations. Please enjoy them. And think about ideas for revitalizing Tokyo's global presence. I want you to come up with ideas as well. Now, there is this new term that we are discussing. It's called urban intangible values. Uh, maybe not so familiar to the Japanese. Intangible means something you cannot touch. Aikachi. So that's uh, the uh, values you can't really touch. That's intangible that I'm going to talk about today. Just regarding the uh, opportunity of this, um, the trigger of this um, like um, a research is that we are starting on this and then for this 40 cities in, in the target and that we have the, uh, the Global po uh, Power City Index. So it's already unannounced every year, so you have already known this. However, we can see the uh, Global Power City so, and how it's going to the city to be, and we're going to have a proposal that we are going to give some material to do this, that we have already um, done this. So just the 40 cities all over the world, and then each like functionality that we have one for the, from Japan, and then this is the first um, and time that we have done. And um, for the first time from Asia, so we have got more uh, number of the cities in Asia. So how we are going to measure this uh, global and uh, power city index? So uh, there are six functionality that we have got. And the first is economy, and the second one, and then research and development. And the third one is cultural interaction. Fourth, uh, the livability. And the fifth, environment. And then last one, the sixth one, is accessibility. There are six um, functionality, or uh, the ones that we are going to measure the ranking, or the, and the city's global powers. So as you can see, for index group that we can see, for example, for um, that uh, an economy, there are six uh, indicator group, uh, like market size and market attractiveness and so on. And in the case of environment, ecology, and then pollution, and then also natural environment, there are three in, under the environment. So six uh, functions, and then uh, of the cities, uh, you can see the uh, like a global and uh, a power. However, and that then and the economy has and uh, more an uh, emphasis on development. That means like uh, twice as much. So we have um, and a lot of the index. So a uh, total of seventy indicators are going to be utilized, and that we announced that uh, the global power city index. And then we have uh, December. 2014, that's a GPCI 2014 result, as you can see, in London, New York, Paris, and Tokyo. Those are the top four cities. And the top 40, and the number one to four actually didn't really change. However, the second one, like a Singapore, and then afterwards is more than 20, and they have already changed a lot. However, 2008, and top was New York. However, 2012, uh, it's changed until London. As you know, the London Olympic and Paralympic has been held. So it's effect of the Olympic probably is easier for you to understand. And then a lot of people are just inviting to London so that they are going to uh, just generate um, all the infrastructures and then also they can fulfill the environment. So that's why it surpassed the New York. So right now, it still is in the uh, number one position. So and since 2012, up to now, it's top um, number one in London. So that's the Asia uh, for the Singapore, and that is in Asian uh, nation, and then uh, like uh, Seoul. And the next one is uh, Europe, and then next Europe as well. And North American city is only one city in New York. 
So just um, have a top 10 usually on the major cities in Europe and then also in Asia. That is a situation. And then we're going to talk about um, today is on top of this, and of course, and for the uh, global power of the city, is it really um, enough? As a peer of the city, is not just the uh, number of the uh, buildings or the uh, very good facility or just for good transportation convenience. However, other than the hardware part that we can really evaluate, so we call it the power to, sorry, human sense, power to appeal to human sense. So that means the people who are working or they are living and then they have something appealing to the people that I started to think about. So I'm going to talk about urban intangible values. That is the, uh, the new uh, sort of the value that I'm going to give you some briefing. Well, we don't have any fixed translation in Japanese where there are many candidates. However, it's already fixed. And then for um, in English, it is untouchable uh, like a value. So the urban intangible values, it's already fixed um, like a word. How however, no Japanese um, um, translations decided. So that's why we're going to use urban intangible values up to now. So re regarding the, um, the significance, there are six um, uh, elements established. And then also choose and then use the uh, 36 indicators. And then for GPCI is 40, however, this UIV includes the 36 indicators. So I'm going to show you the contents inside. There are six uh, elements. Number one is efficiency. Number two, and accuracy and speed. The third is safety and security. Fourth, diversity. Fifth, hospitality. And sixth, and change and growth. So up to now in a GPCR, and of course we have something close to this. However, this operation of the cities, how the people think about, and that kind of the variation is not enough to be done. So just the, and we are going to cover this with the other intangible values. So those are the contents, that's all in English, I'm sorry. On the left is the element, and the next, like on a perspective of evaluation, in the case of efficiency, there are two viewpoints. Um, an accumulation of six uh, city functions and information, and then an accessibility description. Well, like a significant urban functions and information sources in place to support efficient economic um, uh, activities, and then also in accuracy and uh, speed, and then also safety and security and so on. There are six elements and in perspective of a variation each other. It's something important is a sense of the people. If we go to um, London, New York, or Singapore, or Shanghai, you, you can feel something. And if you go to Singapore, there are lots of the, um, the skyscrapers or building, something like this. So just you can look at it. It's like operation of the cities. So operation of the cities are very good that the people can evaluate um, well, that means you can feel uh, very well. That means very highly evaluated in the city of Tokyo. However, that we didn't really just have any numerical value to measure it. For example, and here's efficiency, and there are two things. And for accumulation of the city and the functions and accessibility, first, like office area and then business um, proximity. So that means the Kasumigaseki and, and Marunouchi are very close to each other. So the first one is proximity of business and the government and the district. The second one is the internet usage rate. Well, we don't think about very much anyway. However, it's actually very good data to uh, look at the people's behavior. And then for the uh, circulation of daily newspaper per population, so each individual and uh, an element, and there are two way of thinking, of um, perspective evaluation, and then and for the three indicators of each other. So those are the one for overall um, like evaluation. Here is the, uh, the efficiency, and the next accuracy and the speed, and next and safety and uh, security and diversity. For example. In the case of the safety and security, on the top is the number of the murders per population, 
And then second one is a sense of safety in public places. So we have to um, do some of the questionnaire of each other. And then also air pollution concentration, we have got the data so and we can measure that. For example, and for the sense of safety, uh, like a frequency of accidental power outages. In Tokyo, very, very seldom, it's uh, not, not very much. However, sometimes it's quite a few in the big cities. Next is number of medical doctors per uh, population. The third one is stress-free life, so we have got the stress or not. So that is um, due to the uh, result of the questionnaire that we collected the data. Regarding Tokyo, is something very unique, it's a hospitality service, and then also visitor friendliness. The cities are 21 cities. Why not 40? Well, it's very difficult to answer anyway. However, for the um, data, which is pretty uh, complicated, cannot be gathered very much. So um, out of 40 of um, GPCI, and we have selected the 21 target cities. So just in Shanghai, uh, sorry, for the uh, Beijing only in uh, China, not Shanghai. However, in Tokyo and uh, out of uh, Japan, so uh, not Osaka. So anyway, as you can see here as a result, and the subway transport uh, performance, that is to Tokyo is absolute number one. Next. Days required to start a business for business application is Singapore. Uh, you can do that in one window in one week. And Tokyo, and we have to learn a lot. So under terms for the, uh, the application is number nine, which is not very good. So and of course, and for the national um, the policy, and then we have to do this as well. So days required to start a business in Tokyo is pretty long. And then, and for the sense of safety in public places, we thought maybe uh, number one in Tokyo, however, is uh, not number one. Hong Kong, Singapore are better than Tokyo. And the Singapore is less criminal rate than Tokyo. In Hong Kong, as you know very well in the past, probably why not Hong Kong? However, now is Hong Kong is very safe and very comfortable. So be, uh, because of the, um, this fact that the sen sense of safety and top four are the Asian countries and Hong Kong, Sing Singapore, and so Tokyo. And the fifth is Copenhagen. Next, about uh, the barrier, variety of street, streetscapes and neighborhoods. Tokyo is not very good. And then, well, it's up to the person's opinion. However, Istanbul, Moscow, Kuala Lumpur, Brussels, Brussels, Barcelona, those are the ones are, and is a variety, and the next two on Tokyo is Mumbai. So, well, and we can maybe understand. And then also kindness of residents, and we can be very much proud of here. Stockholm and Istanbul are there as well. However, the top, top, top is the on Tokyo. Next, regarding a presence of creative activities, there are various um, um, fields of the people here and what we can do. And then creativity is very, very important. So um, Richard Freda and Dr. Richard Freda and his uh, creativity have to be considered with uh, creativity or not. It's very important. So and Tokyo is not too bad, however, the fifth. And then top is New York and then Paris and London and Berlin. So New York, Paris, and London, those are our libraries, however, that they are much better than our, ours. So this is just partially that I have mentioned. And then this is the way of thinking, so that is kind of the result. So what is the, um, the Tokyo's position, as you can see? And the red one is the average of 21 cities, and Tokyo is a strength of uh, the blue ones. Efficiency, that we are very strong. Hospitality is very strong too. And safety and security. And on the other hand, about change and growth, it's kind of average. And then also accuracy and speed, it's not too bad. That is a result of the Tokyo situation, or the urban integral valley of Tokyo. So today, 
Uh, like uh, the theme is idea for revitalizing Tokyo's global appeal. So we are going to ask the other speakers to talk about it. So this is the present uh, situation of Tokyo. And up to now, then, so what is the ranking of Tokyo? So today, and I don't give you any number, so on Tuesday next week, um, we're going to uh, give you um, the uh, ranking. So the ranking will be announced next Tuesday. So no, not very bad, you can expect. Something very interesting is that, the, who's the rival of Tokyo? Tokyo is a gigantic city. However, that's a Vienna, was the, uh, like in the very uh, the middle size of the city in Europe. However, it's, we compete with each other and with the uh, Vienna. So that we have something that gigantic city of Tokyo has like the Vienna has. So just how we are going to enhance the presence. So if we understand, that's fine. However, that I know we are going to ask the, the, the uh, people all over the world can understand it. So and today's theme is an idea for revitalizing Tokyo's global appeal. So we'd like to have a very good clue of the three speakers. So after um, getting um, some um, speakers' presentations, so we have a panel discussion and how we're going to enhance the presence. So that concludes my presenta presentation. Thank you very much. So I just made a presentation, but now uh, we have the uh, three main speakers who will give us their presentations. The first speaker is Ms. Astrid Klein. She's uh, getting ready for her presentation now. Ms. Klein was born in Baris, uh, Italy. She's director of uh, Klein Dytham Architecture. And uh, uh, they design architecture, interiors, and installations. And she's been in Japan for more than 20 years. Major clients uh, include Google, Dytham T site, uh, Sony, Virgin Atlantic, etc. And uh, there's this uni very unique activity that she's uh, engaged in. It's uh, called Pecha Kucha Night. So you take uh, 20 uh, slides and you explain it in 20 seconds. And that uh, format has now spread to 800 cities and it's being done uh, near here. So you show 20 slides in 20 seconds, you do a presentation, and we discuss how we enhance our presence. So without further ado, Ms. Klein, please. Hello. Let me speak in English. Well, I was asked to present in English. Uh, it'll be <laughs> easier that way. I hope uh, uh, we can speak Japanese later too. That's OK. Um, it's about sparkling Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo is pretty sparkling already. Uh, everything is nice and clean and orderly. Everything functions well, like uh, Ichikawa Sensei just uh, explained in the uh, urban intang intangible values. And uh, we have beautiful buildings that work, but I want to make it even more sparkling. Tokyo should be more sparkling. Uh, it is uh, working well, but for the next generation, uh, for my daughter's generation, we should uh, work towards making it a happy, genki, joyous, uh, sparkling Tokyo. Um, so, to as, as I said, Tokyo is uh, working well, but uh, um, it is quite, uh, and there's no word for it in, in, in English, a bit otonashi. Um, and it could do with, uh, with more life, uh, it could do with uh, uh, more diversity, more creativity, 
and uh, spontaneity. It could do with a little bit more chaos because that's what, that's what creative people like. Uh, in, in, uh, when there is chaos, there will be creative solutions and uh, a little bit of mess. So uh, I uh, arrived with my business partner, Mark Dyson, in, uh, here in Tokyo uh, 26 years ago. So, uh, but the theme is what has changed in the last uh, 25 years. And uh, uh, yes, a lot has changed. We basically came here uh, because there were lots of uh, iconic buildings that were built during uh, the bubble economy. And uh, uh, as architects, we wanted to check them out. And I think there was a very big uh, architecture tourism. There still is, there could be more, but there still is architecture tourism uh, to Tokyo. Uh, we came because we couldn't believe they would build uh, buildings like Cinema Rise. It's just a bit tired today, but back then it was uh, pretty unbelievable. Uh, that they would build uh, Cinema Rise, or for those of you who remember, there was a, an office building called Crystal Light uh, on Omotesando 1 uh, that was really, really out there. And uh, I'm not saying we liked it, uh, but uh, coming from conservative uh, Europe, you know, London and Milan and Rome, where you can't build such uh, extreme buildings like the Aoyama Seizu Gakuin, uh, we kind of just had uh, open jaws, drop jaws, and said, like, "What?" Um, and uh, also, the quality of the of these buildings uh, was really high. Um, here is uh, uh, Philip Stark ones, and that's what people like to go and see when they when they go somewhere. It's like something incredible. And uh, so, yes, where where have all these iconic buildings gone. What is the iconic building of, uh, you know, the 2000s, uh, 2010, 2015? So yes, I think, unfortunately, the quality has stayed, but the uh, iconic uh, buildings have become a bit, uh, have, have disappeared a bit. And uh, uh, i just like to remind everybody of the Bilbao eff effect. Uh, there was nothing in Bilbao. It wasn't on the map. But uh, when Frank Gehry built uh, the Guggenheim Museum, all of a sudden, it brought in a huge economy to Bilbao. And uh, I think we've done a little bit like that. We've had uh, a Daikanyama effect. No, it doesn't quite sound the same. But uh, yes, I think uh, many more people uh, come to uh, Teesside in Daikanyama. Uh, or to Daikanyama in general, uh, since uh, Teesside opened three years ago. Um, so I think people like when, it, when uh, uh, they like to hang out in the city, they like to uh, be comfortable and then just stroll about. And I think um, we maybe, maybe not only Tokyo, but uh, uh, Japan in general has been looking at tourists like walking wallets and didn't think that after doing a lot of walking and shopping they might be tired and they just want to hang out. So how to get people into a city? Uh, well, Bibao was one and that's an art museum. And there are lots of art museums in, uh, in Tokyo, so I don't want to go there. But Japan or Tokyo is known for lots of famous fashion designers, uh, you know, starting from uh, the first fashion designer generations with uh, Yoji Yamamoto, Isemiyake, Rei Kawakubo, the younger ones, Undercover, and so on. In London, you have the V&A, which uh, shows a vast, the, the, almost pretty much the whole history of fashion design, and thinking that you know the kimono is a is a, a uniquely Japanese uh, uh, dress. There is no kimono uh, museum. There is no fashion museum, and uh, you know fashion fashion inspires pop stars like David Bowie, and even his uh, his attire gets uh, exhibited in uh, in the V&A. Um, like this one here, 
Uh, Japanese was always very appealing, as you can see. I have no idea what it says, but uh, uh, it's probably something controversial, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, how about the fashion museum? Where is it? Um, where is the design museum? Japan is uh, known for lots of amazing, great designs all over the world. And, uh, you know, people, people come to Japan and, uh, and want to see the, where, where all these great designs come from. You know, this, this, this soy bottle is uh, well known all over the world. And, you know, people don't really know it's a Japanese uh, uh, designer who, who, who's made this. And uh, wouldn't it be great if one can build on all these great products. Hey, you've done the first Walkman in the world. You know, Sony is known all over the world, but when they come to Tokyo and want to go and see, I don't know, where the Sony products come from, they go to Sony in Ginza, and honestly, I think they're a bit disappointed of what they see. So uh, it would be great having a design museum where all these great uh, Japanese uh, product designers could uh, um, product designs could be exhibited and uh, to, to inspire even more people. I think, in general, Japanese people are too modest. You should be proud of what you got and show it off. This is uh, the uh, London Design Museum, and uh, the old one, sorry, uh, and uh, uh, all sorts of permanent... They have a big permanent collection, but, of course, they are also... Uh, uh, temporary um, collections, uh, exhibitions there. This is going to be the new design museum in London. Uh, and uh, uh, you would say, yeah, we have a design museum in, uh, in Tokyo. It's the 2121 uh, gallery. But I dare say it's, it's, it's a gallery and it has great exhibitions. Don't get me wrong, I love them. But uh, it's not a design museum. Um, a design museum has a permanent collection and all sorts of product design uh, that can be showed off. Um, it's, uh, in Tokyo, we have a good start with the, the, the designers week, and uh, I think uh, uh, everybody is partaking and uh, putting up uh, beautiful design exhibitions. Uh, but if you had a design museum, you could show the designs of the year in it, rather than just having a, a little token exhibition in the, in the atrium of Midtown uh, showing the Good Design Awards. And so many Japanese car brands. Uh, where, uh, where is the car museum? No car museum. Uh, so, yes, uh, 20 seconds on one slide is long. Um, <laughs> you have Honda, and what, do I, what can I say now for 20 seconds? Uh, this is uh, the NSX. It was a pretty uh, uh, revolutionary design. Um, I, I know uh, somebody who was involved uh, in the design of this car, and they kind of uh, told us we bought a Ferrari, and then we crashed it to see, uh, to see how it works in... Um, to develop a better NSX. Uh, we got Nissan. Yeah, lots to say about Nissan. I chose all red cars um, to, uh, because for me, although there are many uh, different car uh, designs, they all look a little bit the same. They all want to look kakui and, uh, and flashy, but uh, anyway. And then, uh, yeah, this is uh, Toyota. Uh, I just remembered the, uh, the Jumban of the cars, that's why I know. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to recognize it on the road. And I couldn't find the red Subaru, so this is a Subaru in blue. Um, yeah, but um, I don't know. Maybe if there were uh, car museums, uh, this could be kind of, you know, studied in more depth how to... Uh, make interesting cars. So Germany, who has also uh, many car brands, they each have a car museum uh, and uh, a great uh, iconic architecture that goes with it. This is the uh, Porsche Museum in Stuttgart. And uh, 
uh, inside uh, you kind of have the whole uh, evolution of the Porsche car, obviously, uh, and everything uh, that goes with it, down to the sunglasses and T-shirts. Um, next one up uh, will be the Volkswagen uh, Museum, uh, which uh, is not so... Um, uh, flashy, but it works uh, on a big uh, car parking uh, silo uh, idea, which is really cool. Um, this is in Wolfsburg, near Stuttgart. And uh, then we have uh, the BMW World in uh, Munich. Again, very flashy design, um, which, uh, you know, even if, even I, who am not interested in car design, uh, I went to see it in Munich uh, just because it's extraordinary architecture. And I think even uh, there must be more uh, people out there who are not interested in cars and who actually are not even interested in architecture, but it becomes a destination. It becomes a place to go to to see something, something else. It becomes a diverse activity. Uh, this is inside. And then you have the Mercedes-Benz Museum, which I went to see. Um, mainly because I had uh, uh, memories of my parents taking me there when I was only maybe four, four or five years old. And uh, I was very impressed with the concept car back then. And I wanted to show that to my daughter. And uh, I'm... Um, and my father is quite proud because he helped developing this gree here on this car. Uh, apparently there was a, a rally somewhere and a condor flew through the windshield and uh, unfortunately killed the driver and so that's how they developed that. So where is the history of Japanese cars? Uh, being an architect, of course, I'd love to go to an architecture museum. Wouldn't it be nice uh, if uh, there were an architecture museum in Tokyo? Do you know that out of 37 Pritzker Prize winners, Pritzker Prize is the Nobel Show of Architects, okay? Seven are Japanese architects. That's 25% roughly, okay? That's amazing. And, uh, but nowhere is there a place where we can find out about that? That's, uh, the previous slide was uh, the Architecture Museum in Rotterdam, and this is the inside of the Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. They could be better, honestly, not as flashy as the car museums. Uh, and I think uh, we can work on the Architecture Museums, but better than nothing. Um, you are known the world over for manga, anime, and... Where is your manga museum? Nowhere. Just people send them to Asakusa. Uh, no, not Asakusa, what am I saying? Akihabara. And, uh, um, you know, get them shopping in different shops. So, China made the first manga museum. Uh, that's not right, do you think so? Um, it looks pretty flashy, again. I'm not sure if the, that's just the CG uh, that won the competition. Maybe the outcome uh, is um, soon to be revealed and it might look all different. But this is your manga museum and I think it's pretty, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think it makes for a tourist destination. Um, so I think there needs to be uh, work done on, uh, uh, on the museums. Yeah, that's also the Kyoto Manga Museum. Uh, it's nice, but it doesn't seem to be too popular for some reason. Uh, anyway, um, so museums would definitely be uh, a big attraction uh, to get people uh, to Japan. I think Japan is very good in promoting uh, uh, traditional culture, all the, uh, all the temples and shrines and gardens, but we need new culture. It's the new culture that attracts people even more. This is uh, Exhibition Road in London, and the reason I'm showing this is because at the bottom of this road, um, hang on, I need to find the right button here. Oops, is that one? Yeah. At the bottom of this road, there's Natural History Museum, Science Museum, 
and the V&A. And this exhibition road leads up to Hyde Park. And there are 11 million visitors coming to that area per year. Now, one year or two years back, Japan was uh, aiming to attract 10 million visitors. Uh, it's surpassed it now, but if you compare that to 11 million exhibitors, uh, visitors in exhibition, near Exhibition Road, uh, you know, we have way to go. Uh, this is Omote Sando, and uh, what has changed in the last 25 years is that this is no longer a pedestrian paradise, Hokosha Tengoku. Uh, and uh, this is very sad, uh, I find. I think it's uh, not just the building stock that makes for a lively city. Uh, it's the human people, it's the people in the street that attract more people. Um, like here, Exhibition Road used to be just for cars. I know that because uh, uh, I went to uh, the Royal College of Art at the top of the road and it was an, it, this road was very ugly uh, because cars were parking on it and it wasn't for pedestrians at all. Now there are no pavements. It's, uh, people can cross the road wherever they want and the cars have to slow down. So it is possible to live together with the cars on the same road. This is in Brighton and what they've done, they've just done a very long bench and people like to sit down and see other people passing by and uh, just enjoy themselves and uh, uh, hang out after a long day of visiting museums. Uh, you could have uh, long street parties, uh, like a long table. And uh, I think there's a, it's in uh, Nakamegoro, where they have the summer festival. That's pretty cool, lots of summer. But, um, Anyway, it would be great if people could reclaim uh, the street a bit more because where there are people in the street, there will be even more. Uh, here, this is a, a little parking. Uh, so what they've done in San Francisco, they started a program where they reclaim the street one parking space at a time. And uh, so they pay the parking meter and they uh, uh, put a little park in there. And uh, when the parking meter is... Uh, um, uh, how do you say, gone up, no, gone down, uh, they wheel it away. This is a little bit p uh, more permanent. Uh, again, it's one parking space at a time, reclaiming the city for the people, uh, not for the cars. And uh, uh, so people can just hang out, drink a coffee, and uh, see the world go by. Uh, again, just one, one uh, car, uh, car parking space um, extending the pavement. Right now is, um, yeah, you have, uh, we have, um, why am I saying this, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, there should be more people in, in the street. And I'm, I'm particularly thinking of Roppongi, where you have uh, Roppongi Hills and the Mori Art Museum, you have 2121 in Midtown, and you have the National uh, uh, Museum of Art. And in this triangle, it's a great cultural triangle, but people cannot move from one to the other. Uh, it's really difficult and it's not enjoyable. It's an ugly streetscape. And uh, so wouldn't it be great if one started by making a, a triangular exhibition road in, uh, uh, in Roppongi, uh, reclaiming the road for the people, for the visitors. And uh, people, of course, Tokyo gets a little bit hot in summer. Uh, so, uh, having a bit of fresh air, maybe uh, a little bit uh, uh, humidity, uh, these kind of flat fountains, everybody loves them. Mums hate them because the kids always get wet, uh, but uh, uh, it makes for good fun and uh, everybody loves watching what people do and what, how, what accident can possibly happen. 
Um, so this is in uh, London, in front of Somerset House. And you could have performances, a wet ballet as opposed to a, a, a ballet in the theater, outdoor, uh, and synchronizing the water fountains with it. Uh, is it a water ballet, a no, synchronized swimming? No. <laughs> uh, anyway, I didn't know that was happening in Somerset uh, uh, um, House, but in winter it turns into an ice skating rink. And uh, around the ice skating rink, uh, you can uh, drink hot wine and you can uh, uh, yeah, have a, have a um, nice uh, little tapas while watching uh, the skaters go by. Uh, another attraction in a city uh, would be really big art, okay? Tokyo has art, but it's not big enough. It needs to be more impressive and uh, really big, like this one by Anish Kapoor. Uh, I'm saying this because we all know the big spider downstairs. It's, it's pretty big already, but uh, somehow it's much more fun um, mirroring yourself in, in here and uh, seeing how the city gets deformed and see how... Um, kind of projections get reflected in here. It makes for such a photo opportunity. So maybe we need photogenic art, I don't know. Um, big is good. In the same Millennium Park in Chicago, there's also this water fountain uh, which changes um, uh, faces. And uh, some, some faces are uh, more beautiful than others, but it makes for diversity, it makes for variety. I think you can even put your own face on there somehow and uh, see what you look like when you have a water fountain coming out of your mouth. So yes, we need more people in the streets. If you invest in culture, uh, then uh, the people will come. You can make nice buildings. You invest in nice buildings, people will come, they'll spend money. It's a win-win situation. Back here, yeah, that also has changed in the last 25 years. Uh, when we first arrived here, there was lots of music and performances in Yoyogi Park, okay? Cool guys. I think uh, lots of uh, women would come and see them. Um, they're still there, actually. They're just a bit older now. Um, but uh, what I thought was funny is that they made a pavement especially for them now. You can see where they're going to dance every Sunday. It's an institution now. And because it has become an institution, it lost a little bit the freshness, the, the impromptu, the chaos, the, the spontaneity of creativity. There used to be a lot more dress up. Uh, back in the day, uh, when, we, when we freshly arrived from London, we saw punks in Harajuku, okay, punks. But then on Sunday, they became beautiful OLs. So it was just a dress up. And, uh, but, na so, but nowadays, it all has been kind of put away a bit nicely into cosplay. And let's please organize this uh, and have it in big sight, okay? Let's not mess up the streets with ganguros and, uh, and so on. Uh, there, is, uh, there are rumors going on that uh, the ganguros have disappeared from Shibuya, so therefore Shibuya is not so interesting anymore. I don't like ganguros myself, and I forbid, God forbid my daughter turns into one, but uh, uh, at least it, is, it makes for variety, it makes for diversity, it makes for attraction, and people love to see them. But, uh, you know, as, I think it's a warning sign when people say, oh, no, Shibuya has become boring. Uh, so we need more culture. We need more experience. And I think I said a lot more other things which you read. We need more emotion. But more than anything, I think, and I'm talking to you women here in the audience, we need more women in decision-making because we can work on emotion and uh, make people happy. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ms. Klein. And then I have to have, um, it was a very good and a result uh, regarding the ladies. So anyway, the next I'd like to introduce um, Mr. J.T. Singh. Uh, Mr. J.T. Singh was born in Toronto, and right now, and he's um, uh, in, based in and, uh, both Shanghai and Hong Kong. And then and he's the, um, the uh, city branding and the strategist. And he has established uh, uh, JT Singh and then company. And then he's actively involved in everywhere in the world. So this is Shanghai in something very important and um, very famous is the uh, tourist video. And then also Entan Pyongyang and then and for the uh, Pyongyang and, and cities uh, video, which is well seen. So um, then it's already widely featured in uh, such a global media as CNN and BBC and in time. So this year, um, and he is going to have the new gro uh, global platform starting up. So he's going to talk about his activities and also the way of doing for branding and then also unique uh, result that we are going to expect. So Mr. Sin, are you ready? So they have got uh, lots of video, so, and I think he needs lots of preparation anyway. So regarding uh, city uh, branding uh, developers and the strategist I have already named, however, uh, is that okay for you? And then Sin San said yes, because he's generating a strategy, so strategist is the right word. So and then our, and robot, uh, our institution is the Institute for Urban um, Strategies. So anyway, we need to have the uh, strategy for uh, the forming cities. So anyway, um, that you can enjoy um, then uh, Mr. Sin's um, videos. It's very famous in the internet. So probably you have already um, maybe uh, retrieved his name over the internet. So some of them are very familiar, um, the images. Are you ready? Okay, Mr. Shin, please. Hi. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a privilege to be in Tokyo. It's my second time being in the city, and uh, I love it a bit. Um, so I, 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 I thought a lot about what to speak today. Um, because cities are very, I work with cities. Cities are very complex, and it's very hard to describe what I do with cities because it's so multidisciplinary. So um, I did think a lot, and I'll start off saying, firstly, I work with mostly local governments, which is possibly one of the most boring sectors in the world to work with. And, um, and I don't blame the governments uh, that I work with because they have very serious jobs, right? And, you know, when you, when you're, when you have very, very serious jobs, you feel like you have to be a little boring, play it safe. So uh, the governments I work with, I always tell them and explain them and educate them that playing it safe is one of the most dangerous things you can do, uh, especially in a world where it's constantly evolving exponentially. And uh, we need new approaches to solve problems and, and do things in new ways uh, and to get big results. Right, so basically, my, the way I work is to be experimental. To be experimental and try new things is, is, what, I, um, is what I try to look for in, in, in the governments and cities that I work with. So the good news is that Tokyo is, is experimental, and I see a lot of good things in this city. And Tokyo, around the world, in the collective psyche in, in around the world, Tokyo has this, this image as the city, if you want to see the future, go to Tokyo. That is the, by and large, uh, perception that people have of Tokyo. And this is very true indeed, right? It's, it's a very um, credible image to have, and it's a very positive image to have. And this is the image that Tokyo should continue to strengthen it should become stronger and stronger, and because it's a very positive impression to have. No one gets bored of the future, right? It's a very good image to sustain and strengthen. So obviously the biggest proof point that Tokyo is a city of the future is 
this sophisticated uh, subway system. This is by far the most complex and sophisticated subway systems in the world. Not even New York, London, Singapore, Shanghai, Seoul comes close, but none of them could compare with this, right? And I can tell you, when a, when a foreigner comes to Tokyo for the first time, you know, they, they go, they see this and they're like, wow, we are in a very advanced society right now. Because this is how the subway system in my city in Toronto looks like, <laughs> right? And as you can see, it's, 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 it's a pity, right? Um, and if you go to America, the first thing, if you're a Japanese or Korean, the first thing you realize is that you're in a first world country with third rate infrastructure, right? They are way behind. And so um, over there, even this, the, in, in America or Europe, even the excitement for the future is lost. You, you don't feel that buzz, right? And over here it exists, in Asia in general, but in Tokyo and Shanghai, where I'm based in, you feel that excitement for the future. And this is why I mean that Tokyo is a city where you go to see the future. And I hope this, this, this perception and this reality is strengthened for many years to come. So, so the thing is, all in all, Tokyo needs to continue strengthening this, this, this futuristic image. However, it needs to keep doing what it's doing because it's doing a great job. However, it needs to do it in a more um, globally relevant way, okay? Um, and basically deliver that promise from, in a long-term manner. And what does global relevance mean? What do I mean by when I say globally relevant? Well, it has several key meanings that we will talk about, but the most useful and main meaning is to adaptively reflect and cultivate the values of 21st century people. That is a relevant city. So the most important cities waste nobody's talent. The most significant assets of a city is people, right? The quality of the people of cities that they develop and that they attract is the great determinant of urban success and relevance. So many people often forget this, but just like companies, companies are nothing but a group of people, right? The people are the best assets of a company. And the same thing is with cities on a larger scale. Cities are nothing but a collection of people. Obviously there's hardware like infrastructure, but people are the life of the city, right? And this is the 21st century people. Right? They have totally different habits and patterns, and they're constantly evolving as technology constantly evolves. And to attract highly skilled, globally mobile people, you need to reflect their values on a constant basis. So cities also need to constantly evolve as their habits and patterns of, of operating in this world evolve. So the thing is, actually, I'm going to go back. The thing is, when you think of global appeal, when you think of attractive cities, most city governments only think about tourists. It's not just about tourists. It's also about students, researchers, innovators, investors, entrepreneurs, knowledge workers, institutions, sports, film festivals, summits, technology facilities, and a host of other uh, mobile activities that cities are competing to win and retain. Right? So it's not just about tourists. Like if, I, if there's a talented engineer, very talented engineer, right, and he feels that this city is not allowing him to you know, push the boundaries, create new engineering techniques, and so on and so forth, he's gonna leave, because they have a choice. Very talented people have choices. And 64% of the people in the world that are very highly skilled, they're willing to work abroad. So it's very stiff competition. So all in all, a key feature of globally relevant cities is being irresistible to highly skilled, mobile knowledge and tech workers. And these people drive the world economy. Cities drive the world economy, and these people drive successful cities. So firstly, what is um, a, a reputation? Well. A strong city's image that makes a strong impression on people is one of the most valuable 
and useful intangible assets in people. It is the pulling power. It is the emotional pull that cities have that global talent wants, right? And today, however, it's very hard to influence people. It's very hard because the kind of global world we live in, it's, it's information overloaded. How do you track these people who have so much other information to, to pay attention to, right? And I call this the attention deficit uh, disorder economy, the ADD economy, right? Uh, we're living in a crazy time. Every two days, there's more content created than there was all the content created since the beginning of mankind till 2003. Think about that. That's according to, uh, as the Eric Schmidt, the, the president of Google, pointed out. So think about that. All the books, stories, movies, videos, novels, pictures, paintings, all of that that was created from beginning of humankind to 2003 is now done every two days, thanks to this lovely thing we call the internet, right? So, so when, 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 when cities, when I, what I see in cities, I, I work with many cities, and what I see in cities, they, they try to do all kinds of efforts to influence people like traditional media. Traditional media being TV, um, magazines, newspaper, billboards, I can tell you right now, it's totally ineffective. People just skip it, or just change the web page, or just change the channel. People want to see what they want to see, right? So traditional media does not work at all because of this ADD economy. And it's not just young people. I'm not just talking about young people, right, that, that, are, that are becoming increasingly hard to influence. There's an increasing youthification of the older generation as well, right? And it's happening. I see grandmothers with iPads and, 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 and iPhones playing games and, and uh, using messaging, right? So there's a huge youthification of, of, of older people too. So being a digital person is, is, is uh, the norm now for both the young generation and the older generation. Right? So, um, so I'm sure Tokyo also does very traditional media, right? Spends a lot of money on, on traditional media. Uh, but it is not effective. It's superficial. And basically, this is a good statement. The best advertising is not advertising. Okay? So uh, I'll explain more about that later. So the reason, for example, New York City has earned such a strong profile is because it's, it's a very advanced society, a creative society, and who makes significant contributions to science and technology and culture, all right? So like I said, the best advertising is not advertising. It's what you do. It's what you create and what you contribute to civilization. So there are a multitude of ways for cities to influence people and their perceptions by working on initiatives that have substance, not talking like advertising or, you know. Um, firstly, I must say cities are very complex and there's various elements. There's the hardware, right? Buildings, infrastructure, roads. There's the software, right? Like parks, um, bike lanes, cleanliness, nightlife, universities and so on. And then there's the, what I call the orgware, which is the, the governance and the regulations and the policies and the services that the government provides to their citizens, right? So there's so much layers in cities that could be influenced, uh, that could be tweaked to express the city. And like I said, ad advertising, the best advertising is not advertising, it's the city itself. Um, all in all, everything in a city tells a story, either directly or indirectly. And it, it expresses the character of cities. It's, you know, it could be anything. It could be the universities. It could be even your local companies. Like, for example, Uniqlo and Muji express a lot about Japanese culture. And it's, it's a huge influence. I know I, I live in Shanghai, and people love Muji. And they instantly associate it with Japan or Tokyo. So there's all kinds of things that express directly or indirectly the, the character of Tokyo. 
And, and they also express the, the unique identity of the Tokyo Nis people, right? Like I said, I'm very people-centric. And um, as the people are actually the biggest assets of the city, and they're also the, the best advertising of the city. So the unique Tokyo Nis identity, their characteristics and their local pride is a huge asset for also uh, helping influence the power and uh, re relevance of a city. So mainly, there's two different kinds of ways to influence people, right? Uh, one is where the city is the message, right? So the culture, the architecture, and so on. Um, the infrastructure, so the city is the message, right? And then the second one is where the message is about the city. And this is, you know, promotion, advertising, communications, public relations. The ones I like to, uh, uh, is the new media, obviously social media, design, film, multimedia, art. That's the only ones that I work with. The rest are all ineffective um, in our ADD economy. So I'll give you an example. This is, uh, this is, this is an example of where the message is about the city, all right? So this is a, a, a film I directed of, of, for the Shanghai government to show off their uh, power. I call this e-soft power. So it's digital soft power where you're showing and influencing people's minds uh, through the digital realm and the digital economy. And this video, by the way, is one of the most viewed uh, films, official films of a city with over three million views and it attracted a lot, tons of uh, media coverage around the world as well. Watch it on the internet everywhere. Just, just Google this is Shanghai. I'll just leave a couple more seconds on. So that's an example of where the message is about the city. It's it's you're expressing the city is already great. You know, there's a lot of stories to tell about the city, so now you're telling the story about your, uh, about your city. And then there's where the city is the message, right? For example, this is one project I I'm worked on in Shanghai in the old 2010 Expo area, where they're building a new cultural activity hub. It's a shopping and cultural destination, which really wants to be different from the typical mall format. And it's a very unique um, development that's currently happening. And, and uh, this is where the city is the message, right? You're creating a city that is it's interesting to live in, to experience. And, uh, and so this is the difference between the two main ways to influence people's perceptions of a city, right? And it could just not be infrastructure, it could be policies as well, right? For example, the country of Ireland, uh, I think they created a policy where um, they, don't, they have a tax exemption for creative people, right, for artists. So then it attracted a lot of artists and creative people to go to um, uh, Ireland. Another policy idea is um, one of my friends is working in Singapore thinking about banning watered bottle, right? Bottled water, uh, which, uh, and you know, that's a very innovative policy. So one of the greatest ways to actually influence people is through regulation innovation. Right, creating new policies that make cities more livable and sustainable. And um, that's another example of influencing 
people's perceptions about your city and gaining global impact. So, one of the, I, I, you know, I work with a lot of cities uh, um, and I meet a lot of local governments. I travel hundreds of cities every single year, uh, a lot in India and a lot of China especially. Um, and I'll tell you what's the biggest problem with cities, okay? This is the biggest problem. It's just, it's just that they're not living in 2015, right? It's, it's really that simple. It's 2015, but I, the work they do sometimes looks like it's from 2003. Or it's from, even if, you're, if it's from 2013 or 2014, it's too late. The world is evolving very fast, right? And, and so this is one of the biggest problems. Uh, you need to live in 2015, begin 2015, do initiatives that align with 2015. Right, uh, because we're living in very huge times. I mean, technology is exponential, right? Uh, it's not linear anymore. Like the, my my iPhone, right? 50, 40 years ago, it was it took up a huge building in Stanford, four floors. Now it's in my pocket, right? A hundred times cheaper, a hundred times smaller, um, and a hundred times faster, right? That what the, what took 40 years now happens every year. Right? So technology is so fast and global talent evolves very fast as technology evolves very fast. But yet cities, they're not known to be yet, you know, the most innovative organizations. And this is the biggest problem that I see is that you know, they sometimes work linearly instead of exponentially. But they need to get aligned with the times. So be in 2015, live in 2015 is what I say. Um, so this is this is this is very important, and there there are several themes, key themes, key trends that I see as in the coming years as the most important themes that cities need to understand and align themselves with. There are several uh, themes, but I'll share two of them. One of them is um, the emerging climate economy, the climate change economy. Right? This is going to be huge in the coming years. It's going to become mainstream, and you're going to see it everywhere as the severe impact of climate change hits us more and more, especially to cities, as most cities are on the ocean shore, and city uh, rising sea levels will uh, hit them first. So you know, right now, we don't feel the, the impact, but 10 to 15 years, the impact of climate change will be quite severe, um, according to tons of research by scientists. It's a, it's a known fact. And this year, in 2015, climate change is going to become mainstream. In June 18, Pharrell Williams, the world's most famous singer right now, uh, in partnership with Al Gore, a very unlikely collaboration. But in June 18, they're going to have a huge, massive global concert. At the same time, it's probably going to be one of the most viewed uh, uh, TV programming in human history, all collectively, on all continents. And they're going to have a huge um, concert only focused on climate change. So this is the first time in 2015 where climate change is going to become mainstream. It's not going to become this niche thing to only sustainability experts and you know, nature preservationists. No, it's going to become mainstream. So global talent, who is actually very conscious, socially conscious and environmentally conscious, is going to care more. Right? And we all know in, in, in December, there's going to be a World Climate Summit in Paris, which is also another uh, platform for agreeing on the actions needed uh, to curb, to stop uh, climate change or f fight against it. It's pretty much irreversible. But I know I'm sounding like a sustainability kind of guy, but I'm just telling you what the trends are, right? This is what people are going to care about from 2015 onwards, like a lot more than they do now. Um, and for cities, why this is relevant? Well, it's going to affect the economy. No one, no cities like disruptions to their economy, right? <laughs> um, there's, you know, floods, there's going to be increasing droughts. Um, and what that does is disrupt the economy of cities and the work life of cities and the 
the uh, ambitions of, of citizens. And no highly skilled, talented worker wants to go to cities that is constantly disrupted by climate change impact, right? So it is, it is quite obvious that the cities of the future, the most relevant and attractive and appealing cities are the cities that will be proactively prepared to fight against the shocks and the crisis that climate change will bring in the next five, 10, 15 years when they'll get more and more severe in our lifetime. We'll see it, that's a, that's, that's a sure thing. And so one of the most, one of the tests of urban leadership is the ability to recognize a problem before it becomes an emergency. And obviously in Japan, in Tokyo, right, it's, it's, uh, they've already felt some natural disaster shocks and so it's a good time. For them, it's, it's very good. Um, I just saw, I'm kind of going over time so I have to speed up. So urban relevance is when cities take action to divest from fossil fuel industries, carbon industries, and reinvest in sustainable innovations. It's, 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 very, it's very logical. The next theme is the globalization of urbanization. Right? So the globalization, in, in urbanization, the globalization of urbanization basically means that there's a whole new industry about ur urbanization. Urbanization has become a new industry. There's new cities everywhere coming up in China, India, Africa, mature cities, new cities, emerging cities, mega cities, right? And so if you're in architecture, engineering, energy, waste, construction, infrastructure, logis or logistics, you're part of this urban services cluster that is now highly tradable and transferable to all kinds of cities. And some cities like Singapore, Hong Kong, London are becoming experts and they're advising many other cities on how to manage their cities. And that is another huge influential factor Right? So Tokyo is a huge opportunity with such a successful city to advise other cities, because most cities are, have common problems. And so to advise other cities is a huge way to influence the world and increase Tokyo's global relevance. So I have to skip through some content um, just to uh, make it. But basically what I'm saying is the cities is where the problems are and where the solutions are. Right? 50% of the world's population lives here and it's gonna increase, 80% of the GDP is produced in cities, 70% of the energy is consumed by cities. So solutions are needed in cities and because this is where the problems are and to make the most impact to human civilization. And the cities that provide these solutions will have huge impact, huge influence, and huge attraction to very talented people in the, in the world. And so the reason I'm showing a garbage truck is because cities is where big things get done. Cities are practical. National governments, it's really hard to assess the work that they do, right? But for city, they either pick up the garbage or they don't. You can see in the morning if they did it or not, and then you can assess that, okay, the city's not doing a good job. So cities is where you will see more and more impact because they know how to get things done. They're practical thinkers, unlike national governments who are more ideological and, and uh, very distant from the needs of, of citizens. So I'll leave you with a basic model of, that I use with cities. Once the city knows who it is, right, what is the historical strengths? What are, what are we really good at? What are the solutions we can provide to the world and how can we influence the world based on what we're good at? Once you know who you are and then you connect it with who you say you are, how do you express yourself? How do you communicate about yourself? And you align those two things with what people say about who you are because reputation is what other people think about you, not what you think about yourself. Right? So if you line these three, the more closer these are to each other in proximity, the more stronger reputation Tokyo will have. So some quick ideas, uh, I'm gonna go, we can talk more about them in the panel because time is up, right? So uh, I think I'll just talk about them in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So started with uh, talking about the greatness of the Tokyo network. Now, are we living in 2015? Well, some people may still be living in 2002. Some young people uh, may be living in 2025. So I think that's a very important perspective that he shared with us. Thank you very much. So next, uh, I'd like to call upon the third speaker, Mr. Gwenol Nicola. 
Mr. Guénard Nicolas uh, was uh, born in uh, Brittany, France, graduated from the Royal College of Art in London uh, in, with a degree in industrial uh, design. And he established uh, a Curiosity, uh, which focuses on product, interior design, and architecture. He's been involved in various projects, and uh, uh, Berluti, Fendi, Lexus, and Louis Vuitton are some of the uh, prominent brands that he uh, works for. And uh, he has uh, done work with a world-class uh, quality retail uh, facility, Ginza Rokuchome project, the former Matsuzakaya. So he's doing the interior uh, design. He's uh, the person in charge of the interior design of that project. He has won the Kukan Award, Wallpaper Design Award, and IF Design Award, and many others. So, Mr. Nicola, please. Hi, Kumbawa. Good evening. This is Nicola. Today we're going to speak English, which is uh, nice. And uh, we got to talk about Tokyo, the city that we, we love. Um, you know, when, I, when in Japan, everybody always asks me why, why I came to this city more than like 25 years ago. And um, I'm going to tell you a small story. When I was um, 12, 13 years old, my, my brother, which is a, a movie director for Lucasfilm, he brought me to see the first Star Wars. That was a long time ago. And uh, I know it sounds a cliche, like this year we have a new coming up. But what I realized at that time is that you know, I live in very traditional culture frames. And I realized that you, with imagination, you can imagine a totally different life, a totally different world. And that was kind of incredible for me. But the point is, it didn't sound like the future. It sounds like a parallel world. I knew that somewhere this world exists, and I had to discover it. So I went to Paris, I went to London, I expected to find something special. And when I was at school in RCA, I started to look at, I discovered some image of Tokyo, what's happening in Tokyo. And uh, the amazing thing about it, I couldn't find anything. You know, you, you cannot find any image of Tokyo. It's like an invisible city. There was image of a red Eiffel Tower, an image of temple, an image of so many things, but actually you couldn't imagine what it, it is to live in Tokyo. It was absolutely like, incredible. If you look at New York, you can see the city. You can, I, could, I, I like surfing, so I thought, wow, I look at Sydney too. But I could imagine a life there. But Tokyo, I couldn't imagine it. So I look at everything that was made here, and it was at that time, you know, it was a bubble economy. And that bubble just finished, and everything were with amazing things. Things, we talk, we talk a lot about generalities today. We talk about Tokyo as a city, as a huge things. For me, I'm sorry, Tokyo is only people, you know. And I was looking at magazines and things. Who is making Tokyo? I mean, Tokyo is a concept. It's not a city. It's much bigger than that. It's too big to be just a city with five buildings or five million buildings. It's who is making Tokyo today in 2015. I think it's just amazing. We have, when, I, when people come to Tokyo, I don't tell them, OK, go to see this building, go to see this museum, or, because we don't have any, or very few, or go to this shop or buy this. I tell them, go to meet these people, go to meet KDA, you know, because they're amazing. Go to see some other designer, some creator, because you have to meet the people to understand what a city is all about. But at that time, it was very, we didn't have internet, we, we do now. It was only very nice magazine about Japan and everything. And as I read about this man, which is called Nakai, uh, Sakai Naoki-san, and he's a studio, water studio. And he talked about his passion of creating new things and how each individual should express his vision. It was not about Tokyo, Japan, you know, Japanism. He never talked about it. He said, I want this. What do I do to get it? I want a car that looks like a macaron. He goes to Toyota, he goes to Figaro, he goes to Nissan and says, let's go this car, let's go this idea. And the guy says, why do you want to do that? Because I want it. If I want it, someone else will do it. So it's like, you know, each idea should be like um, 
a spiral. You have something, and all the energy comes around you, and then all this energy is created by... You know, you can't start a train with two people. You don't need to beat five million. And that's amazing about Tokyo. You know, like Karl Lagerfeld comes to Tokyo, and he asks the Vogue, um, Vogue uh, chief editor, OK, what is the train in Tokyo? And she looked at her watch and said, which one? Which one? Which one? Every single second, the train is changing here, because someone already has a new idea. And that was, that's quite amazing. The problem of this person was actually the picture, but what he's talking about design, but he's actually with the Japan flag behind him with the acupuncture on his face. I was kind of, oh my God, this is kind of scary. And just at that time, it was a movie by Ridley Scott. You remember, Black Rain, you know? And it kind of looks the same. So, okay, I crossed the world to meet this guy. Why? Why should I meet this guy? And I said, this is, I couldn't, I, I said, there's something there. And so I start to, I send him love letters and everything. Okay, I want to work with you. I'm a genius designer and everything. And he said, whatever, no answer. And one day what I did, I sent a small box with seeds inside. Tane. Sent to him with a message like, accept those seeds as a sample of our work. So he thought he was, I was crazy. So he asked his secretary to check on me. So after the, sec the secretary checked, it was okay. And we started to work together. So it was great. I saw, I was so exciting. It was amazing. I'm going to do like, uh, you know, uh, modern cars, digital camera, and everything. And the first project he asked me to do was Butsudan. So that's the problem of Japan, you know. People always ask you to do things you've never done before, OK? In Europe, people ask you, how many Butsudan you design? Mm, 100. OK, maybe you can design one. How many cars you design? Mm, 10. That's not enough. In Japan, they always ask you to things you don't know anything about. Because they want to challenge, they want, you want us to challenge you, you know, to, to discover a different perspective of your own culture. And that's just so courageous. And who can do that? Only advanced culture, advanced society who are sure about themselves. Otherwise you say, no, 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 don't touch with No, this is our culture. Design something, a packaging for a cup noodle or whatever, something nobody cares about. This is in the house of every Japanese people. And not only the mother, the grandmother, the grandmother, grand, grand, grandmother. Everybody sits in front of this. It's the essence of the culture, and it's in everybody's house. So I thought, I give up. I go back to France. I don't, I'm Christian, and I was raised in a Jesuit school. You know what? It's kind of, you know. And my first project as a designer is a Buddhist temple. Welcome to Japan. You know, this is amazing. You know, it's crazy. And nobody cared about it. So I thought, OK, what am I going to do? So I imagine this box. So for me, I realized that contextuality doesn't matter in Japan. It doesn't only individuality, not individualism. It's very different. You have to think from your own eyes. What do I feel? What do I want? If I want something, maybe I can explain this idea to the other. You know, I hate the word mina. Mina no tame ni no kasukurimashou to kanji. Who is mina? I never met mina. It doesn't exist. You know, you have to f target someone and fall in love with this person and think about what you can do. And usually we are all loving ourselves, so it's a, it's a good start. So the Butsudan I designed was like a, a time machine, you know, because the amazing thing in Japan is that there's no concept of past, present, and future. They are both existing at the same time. Okay, imagine a street in Paris with someone wearing an 18th century costume with a Google glasses. Can you imagine that? He would be arrested by police and put somewhere. I see that every day in Tokyo. A woman, beautiful, of course, wearing a magnificent kimono, wearing not really glasses of Google, but anyway. Nobody cares. It's amazing. I mean, and she could be driving a transparent car that looked like a jellyfish. Nobody would care about it past, present, future exist at the same time. So designing this product, I realized that, and I wanted to, have to, to create this time machine, this object that changed something very modern. And as you open it, it became a Butsudan. And I used the symbol, the temple, and everything, and because I had to do some research. But at the end of the day, was the point was the story, how you design a product which change with time. When you don't use it, it disappears. When you use it, the function is perfect. Well, is people know it's a Butsudan. 
And then I thought, okay, so everything is possible in Japan. I was so sure, and so I said, I'm going to challenge you. So, as you know, contextuality is very important for architecture. You know, you, have, you find the land, and you have the sun, you have the crossing line because the neighbor is like this, and I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to design a house before I found the land. So I designed the house, everything, the architecture, the interior, the tap, Saint-Main, Doga, then we design Shimashita, like a storyboard. And then I look at a place where I could actually build it. So my brother, which is architect, said, yeah, he laughed at me. But I didn't want a building. I, did, I wanted an uh, experience of life. I wanted to design the life. So that's what it actually looks like. It's a three floor. The facade is very simple. It's just two pieces of glass. This is working? OK. No, this is actually one glass, two glass for the facade. So I started to think about how different scene of life, you know, like I don't want to design from outside in. So we started to, to design some sketches like a storyboard, like different. So actually, this is a side. The stairs started to disappear, the facade disappeared, the door disappeared, the window disappeared, door handle, kitchen, everything disappeared. What's left is this glass box with a slope around, like this. So you can actually move inside. This is our studio downstairs. And you move. And the slope is actually looking inside. So imagine a house in space where you have no gravity. You are on the floor, and you jump, and you go to the top of the ceiling, and then you see your house from every angle. So I wanted to create a life like this, with no gravity. Still very heavy, but anyway, this is. And the floor is actually two centimeters thick. Niten go senchi no atsumi kore. Because I wanted, when you go up the, the slope, to be just you know, one instant between inside and outside and different floors. But the amazing thing is you have to design everything, from top to bottom, under the chair, everything. And also, I wanted all the function to disappear. This is a kitchen. So I started to design, you know, this, I know Swiss end, okay, everything is designed. But I found the limit of creativity, because only one thing I couldn't change in a house. Toilet paper. <laughs> because when you have urgency, believe me, you want to go to the combini and buy toilet paper. So actually, everything is designed around this. You know, the size of the Swiss end, the size of the shelf, is designed from 14 centimeter to 12 centimeter. So I learned my lesson. You know, yeah. So all of you know, we try to change the world, but sometimes it comes to very basic things. And actually, this become a product. It's is sold in, in Italy. I'm doing some PR too. So anyway. So, when you think on an idea, as I said before, you know, I always try to find out how this idea can develop to, 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 to layers and everything. And more you involve people in your ideas, and more you present something incredible, you realize it's possible. And when you work with craft people in Japan, the amazing thing is that if you ask them something they know how to do, it's almost like an insult. But if you ask them something impossible, you see their eyes, you know, it's like, wow. The project at that time is not mine anymore. It belongs to them. It's absolutely fantastic. And then there's a different dynamic that is created, and it's really amazing. So, you know, designing this house, I realized that everything is possible in Japan. We have earthquake, we have regulation, we have everything. But when you pass that, sky is the limit. So why we have so many boring mansions, so many boring buildings in Tokyo? You can do anything. Everything is possible. I mean, you have a great architect in front of you. Everything is possible. So why we don't start to design our city like, you know, I think we should have a commission, you know, like commission that, OK, you can build this height, you have this material, this earthquake. But we should have another commission and say, OK, what this building brings as novelty? What is your new idea? What did you bring for a better life of people? Because, and this, if you don't pass this test, you cannot build it. You know, you should bring something. Bigger window, bigger green, whatever. I want to have this commission. Because you know, this building, it was out of law. Out of law because there's a small office in Shibuyaku, you know, where they review project that nobody really understands, you know. And when it looks OK, they say, OK, go. I think we should have a bigger office. We check if the project is meaningful from creativity. And then we can have an amazing Tokyo, you know. 
and architect will flow from the world. We are only city like this. In Paris, you cannot build anything. You know, you have to line up your window and everything. Who cares to line up the window? We design for people. We don't design for architecture. We don't need walls. We don't need floors. We don't need anything. Imagine all the streets transparent. It will not look much bigger. This house is very small. It looks huge. Because the, the end of the wall of my house is actually the house, the wall of the next, next house. You know what I mean? That's just amazing. Because it's totally transparent. And the city will look much, much bigger. But talking about spinning city, do you know that Tokyo is actually spinning in a good way? When I was working in uh, Nikkei Shinbun, um, Nikken Seke asked me to work on a project for uh, Nikkei Shinbun new headquarter. So they asked me to do um, a showroom on second floor somewhere. But I thought this, the architecture was so beautiful, I wanted to, to bring this object in the center. Because Shinbun, I know it's, Shinbun is a newspaper. So I imagine how to translate this image of information. You know, when you print newspaper in a factory, you have this, I saw, I love movies. So I saw this movie of huge paper floating into the factory. It's amazing. It's all printed, but it's all white because of the speed. So actually, the next day I talk about this project, I bring the mock-up immediately. I would say, I want to do this. We have to do this. And they all support to create this. And the amazing thing is that this project happened in difficult time. You know, when many projects, four or five years ago, you know, everything was stopped and the economy was not so great and everything. The problem of this is that uh, the Kabu stock is projected on, the build, on this. So imagine you do the opening and the, the stock going down. I was not worried about the interior design. I was worried about the stock, you know. And the day, I'm not kidding, the day of the opening, the stock went up. I was like, okay. <laughs> So I was so happy. I was so happy. And everything else. So Nicolas Sandro, this car, no, show me. Ah, daijubu, daijubu. And uh, this, this was the result. But the in interesting thing I learned about this project is that actually, you know, the Malonochi area is planned as a moving city. It means that every building you have here, this is the uh, emperor. This really doesn't work, but yes, maybe. Arigato. <laughs> This is, you know, the emperor city, which is static. And everything is spinning around. Okay. It means each, each building here around is planned for the 10, 15, 30 years. We're going to move. Don't you think it's amazing? We are living in the middle of operating system. The city is moving. So some people say, oh, no, 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 no. I imagine my mother. No, oh, poor Gwenel, you're living in a city that's going to disappear. What? As a creator, it's fantastic. We can plan the future. Okay, it means that when you create a building, it's, you know it's going to last 5, 10, 15, 30 years. It's fantastic. It's like we're going to t we can imagine how to recycle it, how to use it. If you make a building for 10 years, you don't use a stone that's going to disappear. You know, you, you, everything is different. So it's a, it's, a, it's a city on time. So it's like really an operating system. So it's like an amazing thing is that we are here to help make it spin faster. It's like application, okay? Everybody is like open system. What's successful is open system, you know? Every, everybody will try to close it. No, no, this is closed, no, no. Every, each of us, all, everybody can bring its own application. So let's create some apps for Tokyo. What in apps? An application is something that you really want and you think that might help other people. That's how this world is growing. And we have to do the same thing for Tokyo. You take a street and you imagine, this is going to change in 10 years. What are we going to do for it? So we have so many potential projects available for us. So what I'm really concerned about, I don't want to build new big buildings and everything. I'm, worried, I'm concerned about how everyday life of people can change. Because it's spinning in center, but has to spin, spin everywhere. So we have to help to create this dynamic. And this will be amazing. So working on different projects, I started to, to see how I can influence this, make it spinning. So I was working with Uniqlo for this project in Shinjuku, which is this huge building here. So there's a lot of stuff inside. And I wanted the, the facade to t totally disappear. You know, and we have, you can see here, instead of having a square box going down with a big logo and everything, actually I dissolved the entrance with different towers. So you can see daytime and nighttime, 
this old box on the top disappear. And this has become much more human scale. So this, the street, why is the street? Why is the shop? Every, everything is totally dissolved. So imagine the street. We don't need to have linear street like a Ginza. I mean, the shopping window is like 1903. Four more minutes? OK. So I have to spin up. Huh? So anyway, five more minutes? Madamada. Madamada? Mada, mada. Five more minutes. Wow, okay. So I have to spin. So I imagine the same thing in Ginza. You know, it's no shop anymore. It's just a, a crossing, you know, and it's just like a public and private. It sort of became one space. So I'm going to skip this one to show you something different. But you know, I started to work with, I mean, architecture, everything. Tokyo is, everything is connected. It's not only architecture, city, and everything. We, you cannot concentrate on one part. You know, when you explain to a foreigner comes here, okay, which one is creative here, which one is moving? Everything is moving. So I was working with Lexus, and there was a lounge of this car, and uh, they wanted to, I wanted to create a space which is totally removed from reality. So you can drive the space into this tunnel made of three kilometers of fiber, and it looks like that. So the entrance, you have this floating stuff. And then, so the car presented it, those line like this. So when you ride that, you don't know if it's like a small, small object or a huge object. So sense of reality, this totally disappear. But what was nice is at the end of, at the end, you know, this car was electric or hybrid. So no sound, it's not a car anymore. You know, so when you drive the car, I remove all sense of reality. You were driving this light, the, the top of the car is totally transparent. So you're driving in this, this you can feel all the, the sensibility of the car. Every small thing that people actually design, you know, Japan is about things you don't see. And it's the first time people say, oh, I realize that Lexus like this. Oh, I realize this. Yes, you have to remove some, some element, you have to remove a sense of reality so people can actually feel their own, exper ex their own experience. And then, after 15 years in Japan, I, was, I thought, okay, I have to show my, my experience in Japan. I have to express in Europe how I felt coming here. So, in Milano Salone, you know, there's every year all design community comes and everybody designs chairs and everything. And, I thought, okay, I want to show how I feel about Tokyo and how technology could actually disappear. And because you don't see technology in Japan, I mean, what is technology? It's totally disappeared, it's invisible. So I use this small ball that you have on your desk here. So I use this object to create this space. You don't, don't eat it, huh? Wait, 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 okay? And it looks like that. It's a space where you have hundreds of balls floating into this. And everything is programmed. So they are, they are floating like this, you know, with system of air and uh, the program, so we can control waves and everything. So the image, for me, this is the image of Tokyo. You know, it's, it's movement of a, What is movement and light? It's people, it's life, you know. So we don't recreate life, but we express it someone there. If you see something moving, it means someone did an action. And if you look at Tokyo after, tonight, you will see it looks like that. You know, these moving things. Especially today, there's a big fog outside, and you only see the light. You don't see any building, you don't see anything. And actually, what's amazing is that it's very tactile, you know, you can play with it. It's like magic. You know, you can take it, you can put it back, you can recreate it. But when I saw that in Milan, I said, okay, this is nice, but what will be the next step? And actually, we did the same exhibition in Tokyo, but actually, you could eat it. So you can play with it, and at the end, you could eat the thing. So the exhibition disappeared. So you, you're probably wondering why you have a ball in, in, your, in, your, in your desk, in your chair. So I will ask you to do something, okay? I think you all have a ketai, ketai or... Maybe you have a light on this. Okay, so can you rub for like 10 seconds around, like this? Okay, so I will ask you after 
to throw the ball at me. When I say one, two, three, you throw the ball all together, please. So when you re when you're really far, try to to throw really strongly. Okay. こういう感じ。もうちょもうちょっと。Okay. So okay. So yeah, it's okay. More or less. Okay. So one, two, three. Arigato. Welcome to Tokyo. One, one more thing. I have a book coming up which explains <laughs> which explain how, how Japan changed my life. Okay, so you can see it's coming next month. Thank you. Thank you very much, all speakers, for your presentation. So next, we'd like to move on to the panel discussion. So all of you and for the panelists, please come up to the stage. Thank you. And Professor uh, Hiro Ichikawa, uh, the Executive Director at the Mori Mem uh, Memorial Foundation, and serves as the moderator. Okay, I'd like to start uh, the discussion today. Well, I have to leave at 9 o'clock sharp, so um, there are uh, great uh, presentations. So it's only 10 minutes left, I'm sorry about this. So anyway. So in each individual and uh, person that uh, we have already asked them add some of the um, like a clue what homework. So it's necessary to have idea for revitalizing Tokyo's global appeal. So there are quite a few clues inside. So probably it's already stimulated and I have got a good solution. However, that um, it might be in you know, a very wrapping up. So um, I would like to ask everybody who's going to uh, just uh, present your homework. So please give us the ideas for revitalizing Tokyo's global appeal. So the ladies first. So I'd like to start from um, the client side. Uh, well, this is going to be a repeat. Well, iconic. Uh, like architect and I have to be there. So architecture of the iconic ones there from and uh, like I'm going to be very excited as architect and many people are coming. Um, so that means we need to have more and more architecture or iconic architecture. And the economy is getting more vitalized and then also vivid. And then also so to construct a building it's Probably other than the museum or art museum, probably it's not necessary to build. However, I would like to create lots of act activities. So how is going to vitalize the on the road or the streets itself? Because like a uh, most appealing part by the people are the uh, street. So just the people are gathering at a certain place that we are going to look very curi uh, with a curiosity what's going on there. So as more and more people are attracted to come, and for the human being, just um, they like to see the other people is watching. So that is uh, the most um, like enjoyable thing. So I think we should focus on that. For today is in her uh, presentation, and talking about the museums. So. And there were not so many of the place to dispatch the um, like uh, some message. Well, that's true. 
like there are quite a few sources here, but um, that we do not use um, that the source or some of the object. There are quite a few good things there, but not utilized fully. So just we are going to be much more uh, like a confidential, uh, sorry, and with a confidence. So and we have to show to the world that because we have a lot to do and a lot to have. Same question to Mr. J.T. Sin. Work. <laughs> How to strengthen the Tokyo's power? Um, well, I didn't get to share um, some of the uh, ideas I had to just spark the imagination of, of um, some ideas that Tokyo could implement. Um, I would use the 2020 Olympics as a way to uh, be a catalyst to solve big problems that you can then showcase to the world that Tokyo is a problem-solving city and solving big problems that the world needs. Uh, for example, and the, the problems sh this, that Tokyo solves should be really in aligned to the actual problems that Tokyo really has. Like, for example, aging. There's a great initiative happening in Barcelona. Um, it's in my slides, I can't remember the name, but they're, they also have an aging society and they're creating a a, a, a program where they use social media and the tablet and the iPhone to connect seniors so they can be more connected to each other and connected to the community and connected to friends so they don't feel lonely and, and it's like a trust network. And this is a great initiative and it actually won first, first place from the uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy um, um, organization. And so this is another great initiative that I think could also be transferred to Tokyo. Um, another solution, can I, can I tell another one? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, another thing that I see in uh, many cities um, is the way cities uh, solve their problems. They, they usually have what you call a R, um, what is it, request for a proposal, RFP, and they de carefully define and, uh, and describe the, the, the service that they need, right? Um, and this procurement service, uh, and this procurement. And, and I think uh, it's very problematic because what they really need to do is define a problem, uh, really frame a problem in a statement, and then ask the public and ask basically you know, all companies in the public to, to uh, contribute, to, to, um, to really say what their solution is. How, they, how would they solve this problem? And then choose the best one, right? Because when you do the current way that you, that, you know, that very descriptive request for proposal uh, way, you usually get the same companies, the big companies to offer their solutions, which are usually not the most innovative or uh, um, inexpensive. Uh, so I think the way cities, uh, purchase their services um, and purchase uh, solutions should change and access a broader uh, uh, amount of uh, players. Thank you very much. And I have one question to Shin San. In Pyongyang and Shanghai, you have an excellent uh, film that you have produced. How long does it take? And we have like inspiration, it's like momentarily um, that you I'm going to repeat. And in Shanghai and in Pyongyang. Pyongyang. My question is, how many days to make uh, the inspiration to make such kind of splendid video? Well, um, so video is one of my favorite storytelling tool. And, uh, and the techniques that I use are very pioneering. Like, uh, we create our own techniques, uh, basically. Um, and I typically like to use time lapse because it's such a great way where you capture cities. Um, and the most important aspect is storyboarding, you know, uh, and getting access to locations, basically. So I do an analysis first, which takes a couple of weeks to really understand the city. And the, basically, the way I do that is to walk, walk, and walk, all right? high rooftops. I've been to over 100 rooftops in Shanghai alone. <laughs> right? so, um, 
And I'd love to, I'd love to, I think a very cool video should be of Tokyo as well. Uh, I'd love to do that. Um, so it takes roughly about a month or two months with uh, storyboarding, analysis, and shooting and editing. Uh, and the music as well, I always do custom music, sound effects, sound designs to really uh, be uh, aligned to the nature of the city, right, to capture it. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, thing that I think we should, we should tell uh, uh, Japanese people is that I always have the feeling, um, living in Tokyo, that everybody feels that Tokyo is like behind. You know, it's like, huh, look, New York, Paris, whatever is happening there. To be honest, you, you, what's happening in Tokyo now will happen in 20 years, 30 years in the rest of the world. You have to understand that you are alone in a front. So you cannot look at other people, what they are doing, and be inspired. You have to find your own way. I was in Europe uh, a few weeks ago, and there was this Davos uh, Swiss uh, meeting of all the big brain of, uh, of uh, economy, and one guy said, mm, yes, European, community, European economy start to look like a Japanese economy. Yes, but it's not only the economy, you know. The whole system will, is evolving in Europe and the rest of the world, like what Japan is. We have to re realize we, we as uh, Tokyo it, we are in front. So we have to find our solution. And we are so, Tokyo is so much advanced. If you look at, I mean, I mentioned uh, operating system. Tokyo is such an amazing system. Okay, you go to a convenience store. It's a convenience store. It's a Yubinkyoku. You can send your snowboard to Okinawa, no, to Hokkaido. You can uh, have great coffee, amazing. Everything is there. What's next is you can charge your bike, you can charge your car. You don't need to, you don't need to do anything. The key word in Japan is fusion. If you go, we have, we had Uniqlo before, we had big camera. Now we have Bikuro. Bikuro? That's okay. Shinjuku. Okay? So everything is fusion. Okay? So how you can fuse everything? It's only the power of Japan can do that. We have big company. What's wrong with that? Uniqlo has such a power. And they, go, they work with someone else for their merit, but also for our merit. So let's put in one room Toyota, Moribiru. Um, a bunch of uh, Panasonic, uh, everybody, and say, can we design a building which is different, a car which is different? Okay, when all the architects design a, um, a house, you lose half the space of the ground floor to put one car. Don't you think it's just insane in Tokyo? Can we design a car that became 40 centimeters thick when you don't use it? You know, I mean, if someone Gucci designed lamp that disappear when you don't want it. Be inspired by what was happening 50 years ago. Technology is there. It's a piece of cake. We can do it. And we save half the space of Tokyo. You know? And everything is simple. It's fusion. We have to all work together. You cannot say, building should look like that, car should look like that, clothes should look like that. No, everything is connected. That's the amazing thing about Japan. And the energy and synergy exist. It's very simple. It's already, even things we don't know are are happening, and we have to be part of it and initialize this. So we need idea, we need, it's like, you know, when I was in, the, in Shibuya the other day, it was a car behind coming, I didn't hear the car. Car don't make sound anymore, okay? So, we have to ask musicians to design cars. Don't ask car designer, who cares, they all look the same anyway. But imagine you have a traffic jam in Tokyo, it sounds like a symphony. That's Tokyo in 10 years. Let's think like this, you know. I'm doing a, a project in Ginza, and I want to design a new, interf new interface to access, you know, information. So everybody, okay, let's ask interface designer. No, no, we don't ask interface designer. We ask a, a no artist to find a gesture, which is typical for Japan, because it's so beautiful, and he will find a gesture which will connect human being to technology. Use culture, use everything is there. You just have to connect technology and the sensibility. And it's done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, the time is running out, so just the very last one. And then you have um, Mipi Japan. 
So that is uh, Central Europe. Um, that is the um, for real estate development meeting. So it's going to be held here in the, in Japan in the uh, 21st of uh, um, May. So um, that we have much more time to discuss on. However, just you know, it's very attractive enough for the presentation itself. So maybe and that and we are very confident uh, regarding uh, Tokyo, not only myself. So like moving city, so mobile city, is that so? So and how we are going to just appeal our strengths to others. And we can already solve everything in one day of today. So ICF is going to be in a series. Like in October has a big conference. So by that conference, and then we have to have some suggestions and how we are going to appeal um, as a, a global city. And thank you very much indeed for three presenters. We are going to give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for your participation.